Yeah, I already got yeah a couple of fish. Sure. Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, thank you. Do you want to put a place aside because the vultures will have a lot? No, I'm fine. I'm fine. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Well, I guess you're at least a jackpot still. I'll grab one. It's like waiting for the second coming waiting for that. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.
time, aren't we? Should we just make it up? Okay. Um, we'll make it up. Uh, I think it's the public time start. Our, our speaker today is um, Sturgis Matulis. I've uh, got the pronunciation wrong. Sturgis is from, uh, uh, has come to us today from Surrey University, uh, where he's uh, a lecturer at the um, Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Uh, and he has been doing research into um, seismic design. Uh, of his, and his talk today is going to be on um, seismic um, design of bridges and structures, perhaps. So, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Gibbs. Um, so, uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, deliver this lecture uh, at ICOM Construction, since I know we have uh, a broad interest in constructions, uh, bridges, tunnels, and and also in the earth, uh, earthquake prone areas. So uh, in this lecture, I will trade the research that I've been conducting the last 10 years, almost the last 10 years, during PhD studies and my postdoctoral studies. And I try to keep a contact with uh, practice. Uh, I've been uh, working as a consulting engineer, consultant engineer uh, in a um, long highway in Southern Europe. And at the same time, I was attached to an industry uh, that was producing barriers and expansion joints for, uh, for uh, bridges. So I do have a contact with um, uh, practice. And uh, I say that I would place myself between, uh, between the academics and uh, the petitioners. Uh, hence, I characterize this lecture as the link between uh, fundamental mechanics, dynamics, and design-oriented research. In the last years, um, the conceptual design of bridges have, have been evolving um, rapidly, especially in seismic prone areas. And this is due to the fact that uh, bridge engineers may either adopt uh, isolation in order to receive the seismic loading, or integral bridges, which means that uh, pieces are connected rigidly to the deck. In many cases, the abutments are connected rigidly to the deck, and this design concept um, actually helps us to dissipate part of the induced, the induced seismic energy through high theoretic behavior, which means that peers uh, respond in an elastic manner. There are lots of bridges, such as the abutments, for example, and the backfill soil, which are developed during earthquakes. And this is what I show you today: how two uh, structural parts of bridges can be utilized in order to reduce the, the seismic movements of the deck, reduce the cost of the bridges, and improve aesthetics, as uh, as uh, the the piece can be designed with smaller sections, can become slenderer, and foundations which uh, reflect to almost 100% of the final cost of a bridge may also be uh, designed in a cost-effective way. Bridges are vital parts of the lifeline system, and they should maintain emergency mobility and accessibility, not only in um, uh, day uh, uh, circumstances, but also even after severe earthquakes. And imagine what would happen if uh, a bridge would collapse uh, after an earthquake and ambulances don't have access to the hospitals. On the infrastructure woes uh, take, take on U.S. economy. This is a Reuters uh, article that, that was uh, published uh, a couple of years ago showing the toll place in the U.S. economy uh, due to the deficient bridges, which is uh, an almost trillion dollar problem. In 2010, uh, you can hear the American Society of Civil Engineers card showing that deficient and deteriorating transportation systems, including just drained uh, billions from the economy in 2000 alone. You can see the top, uh, on the top figure uh, the healthy system of the Hakozaki uh, junction. 
on, on, on the left you can see uh, a bridge that has experienced spinal sitting. The right, one of the most famous uh, failures on bridges, the Hasi Expressway that was collapsed, that was totally collapsed during the 1995 Kobe earthquake, uh, causing dramatic, um, dramatic disruptions of traffic and actually uh, divided the city into, into two isolated areas uh, after the earthquake. So this is a global seismic risk. Uh, with a red color, you can see the areas that do experience uh, large seismic actions. You can see here that it's on the west side of America, uh, in the Arab countries, southern Europe mostly, and uh, in, in the south, southeast of Asia. So what exactly is the seismic action? Uh, why do we have to address the seismic issues in uh, bridge design. The is a horizontal load. In fact, it is an acceleration that is imposed to the structure. And this acceleration is translated into inertia loads. So uh, the structure produces the seismic loads and loads itself by inertia loads. So this is the seismic action, which would not be dangerous at all if we we, we didn't have a uh, uh, constructed environment like bridges and buildings. So the, the seismic design is required for structural design in modern building codes, codes such as Eurocode 8, such as uh, ASTO that is applied in America, Caltrans in California. So uh, bridges are nearly isostatic systems having low redundancy, which means that one failure may lead to cost. Seismic events can cause catastrophic failures, endanger public safety, and have tremendous impact in economies. I saw before the uh, collapse of the Hatsin Expressway, and, um, which is related to the, to the impact in the economies. And bridges are vital parts, of course, of the lifeline system that should maintain uh, emergency mobility and accessibility even after severe circumstances such as floods, earthquakes, and uh, wind effects. I know that you are acquainted of this project. This is uh, a ECOMS project in Hong Kong. It was built in 2010. There are many different design concepts that the bridge engineer may, may uh, use when facing with the problem of uh, the seismic design of bridges. In that case, uh, seismic isolation was used, which means uh, the deck is supported on the piers <coughs> bearings through isolation devices and slides during thermal movements onto the piers. The bed receive this serviceability movement and as such the piers are not really loaded during the, service, this, uh, the, the serviceability limit state of the bridge. During a quake, these devices uh, again receive the large seismic movements and do not transmit seismic loads to the peers. But there are many different design concepts that an engineer may adopt um, to design a bridge against earthquakes. So let's take the, the concept design of bridges against earthquakes from the beginning. Uh, you can see structural elements of the bridge, the deck and the substructures. The substructures consist of bearings, piers, foundations, and abutments. Uh, I have divided this slide into three uh, specific part. The first part is the structural elements. The second part with the gray zones uh, are the design issues. And the third part is the, um, the seismic design considerations, I would say. So the deck, the, the deck is usually based on construction methods. The selection of the cross-section has to do with serviceability, stressing, not influenced by seismic action. We, we have published in the past a research showing that, in fact, the deck is not affected by seismic actions, not even in bridges with rigid peer to deck connections. While at the same time, banks one of the most important structural elements of um, uh, earthquake resistant bridges, since the bridge relies heavily on their seismic performance. At the same time, we have many, many different types of bearings. There are many companies producing bearings. And in most cases, applications and 
uh, industrial innovation went further than codes and theory. So we have to decide about uh, uh, when we design it, about the, the right uh, barriers and the, the, the correct use of uh, isolation. Peer, peers do participate during earthquake. They either be designed in an elastic manner, which means that they're not expected to uh, uh, exhibit elastic response, or they can, uh, they can design um, in order to dissipate part of the induced seismic energy, which means that high theoretic behavior of the peer is expected during earthquakes, so bridges rely uh, on the peer's dissipation. And of course, an over design of, uh, of the seismically isolated bridges peers may lead to the over-design of the foundation as soon as foundations should have uh, a 4 percent over-strength as compared to the strength of the peers. But what happens to the abutments? The abutments are not utilized in the earthquake resistance system of the bridge. <coughs> Due to many serviceability issues, I'm, I'm going to show you in the next slide some of these uh, design issues. They're usually designed as if they're training structures, not design is applied, even though collision forces of the deck, which oscillates in the longitudinal direction of the bridge mostly, so that may collide on the abutment, and the abutment um, <coughs> may uh, maybe large rotations, which lead to span and saving mechanisms, and to uh, 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 significant failure modes of bridges. So this is the initial concept. When we design a bridge, we have to have the, the seismic actions lower than the resistances. So uh, bridge engineers utilize isolation devices such as viscous dampers or bends. So this damper uh, actually dissipates the energy through viscous behavior, and banks dissipate the energy through hystereric behavior. Or we can increase the resistance. But, um, by increasing the resistance, at the same time we increase the stiffness of the bridge, which uh, the bridge is not necessarily safer than the previous one, than the previous design concept. It's is not straightforward in uh, structures with dynamic loading, because uh, the, the reduction in the period, and we may um, attract, in that case, uh, larger seismic loads. This can also be uh, probably applies to uh, bridges under wind effect, under wind loading. The size isolation, uh, the idea of, uh, of isolating a bridge against size, uh, seismic load seems to be a very good idea, actually. It provides flexibility to the structure, so the initial structure without isolation would be up here, and this is the, the loading, <coughs> inertial loads. If you use isolation, the system becomes much more flexible and uh, the isolation reduces rapidly inertia loads. This is a great idea. At the same time, we may, you, we may also <coughs> utilize things uh, high capacity, having high dynamic properties, high um, capabilities, and to even reduce further the seismic load. Yes, this is a very good idea. Bearings reduce the serviceability loading of the peers, the seismic loading and increase dumping, but a past quake showed that actually that was not a really good idea because many, many bridges have failed during the 2011 uh, Great Ahoku earthquake in Japan. Many banks were found to uh, have ruptured completely through last summer and direct tension. So what happened there? A recent publication uh, that was uh, pu um, of mine uh, in a journal showed that uh, if we use double lines of bearings uh, on top of the, of the pier cups, then we have to receive a tensile movement. The bearings have to receive a tensile movement, and bearings are not designed against tensile movement. They're not designed against tensile loads. So these bearings have failed, and many bridges uh, have experienced collapses, span acidics. Uh, collapses. If we, if we think in terms of serviceability of bridges, we will see that the bearings uh, do need replacement after some years of the bridge service. Uh, the 
hydrated breed responds with increased displacement since it's quite flexible. And of course, breed, breed, isolated bridges are statically determinate bridges, and failure may lead to collapses. There are expensive devices do sharing in, in very high prices because they also sell the knowledge and the experience that have been done uh, in order to produce such bearings. And of course, technology went further. Theory codes provide some um, um, checks against uh, elastomeric bearings and sliding bearings, whereas at the same time, the market can provide us with uh, a few hundreds of different types of bearings. So the question is, uh, did joint expansion joints cause more problems than they solved? That um, something like 10 years ago, uh, I, I made a turn to the unconventional desi bridge design concept, and uh, I tried to utilize uh, earthquake-resistant abutments. Those are elements which were not supposed to be effective uh, and active uh, during earthquakes. So this is the idea. This is the professional bridge, large sections, large foundations, and one abutment that is in fact, only retaining the backfill soil. Well, the, the idea that was proposed and was published several times in journals was to provide high capacity external support, horizontal support, like this abutment, and reduce effectively uh, the peer section, the foundation design, the the, the, the foundation, and of course reduce uh, the use of bearings. So I'm not going to go through all these uh, abutments. You can see here many different uh, C-type abutments that, that have been published in the past. Uh, several integral abutments here that were used uh, to minimize the seismic demand of bridges. And ideas on uh, integral bridge construction methods, some new construction methods that will cover uh, bridge paths up to 45 uh, meters. We all, uh, um, um, we also went through uh, shake table tests. Uh, shake table tests um, are modeling in, in, in laboratory uh, real real seismic actions, real seismic motions. So that was a single degree of freedom that modeled the the deck of the bridge, and there was a connector here that that was modeling um, uh, the resistance, namely the stiffness and the damping of the abutment. So, how are abutments being treated in, in Eurocode or in other American codes like ASTO? Uh, if we use a C type abutment, then the abutments are not considered to contribute uh, at the seismic action. If we use integral abutment, Eurocode 8 Part 2 uh, requires that a behavior factor Q equals 1.5 shall be used. So, this uh, Behavior factor, which corresponds to the American R factor, is a factor that shows how much of the induced seismic energy can be dissipated by concrete sections by the peers. So if that if that uh, factor is close to one, that means that the structure shall remain elastic. So we use integral abutment bridges. If we design integral abutment bridges, the bridge shall remain elastic, even though the piers are connected rigidly to the deck. This is their philosophy. Uh, they utilize either integral abutments, and Carans provides an equation that um, for the calculation of the horizontal stiffness of the uh, abutment plus the backfill soil. And there has been uh, uh, there has been there have been quite a few studies on the same integral abutment concept, which is. Um, a, f a stub type abutment that is connected through a connector, which is in fact a hinge to the pile cap and the piles. And this hinge, in fact, reduces uh, effectively the bending moments of the piles. And so the piles uh, are not susceptible to fatigue loads, uh, mostly um, to fatigue loads uh, like bending loads and um, constrained movements and uh, constrained uh, shear stresses. Uh, what is the requirement of Eurocode uh, for the expansion joints? So this is the expansion joint. It's the gap between the deck 
uh, and uh, the back wall. This wall is called back wall. So uh, this punctured joint has to take into account, of course, permanent movement due to creeps. Gets, has to take into account 50%. This is a, a 0.5 according to Eurocode 1, and multiplied by the the gradient of the, the uniform temperature gradient. This joint has also has also to take into account 40% uh, of the seismic movement, 40% and not the whole seismic movement. If we expansion joints against a total seismic movement, then probably the expansion joint will, will calculation will show that we will need something like uh, 300 millimeters of expansion joints, which are very, very expensive. And this joint should be replaced several times during the life of the bridge, which means that the force of the bridge will be uh, increased rapidly due to the need for the replacement of these uh, devices. So the result of the coast design, uh, 1990, the Costa Rica earthquake, the deck pounded on the abutment. No vision for this collision effect was, um, uh, was taken into account during the design. And so we had uh, a tremendously updated um, uh, Apartment, which of course cannot be retrofitted, and there are some slight uh, damages in past earthquake pounding induced failure of the expansion joints, and of course you can see here that the bridge might be uh, sink the traffic access, but the expansion joints would not allow the emergency um, vehicles to uh, the bridge. Can effects do? Uh, uh, can the effects be modeled? In, in practice, in, with a uh, uh, finite element software, uh, you can see here that, um, of course, we can uh, model such effects. Uh, for example, uh, this is a Plaxis model that was uh, modeling such pounding forces on, a, on an abutment with surface foundation. The model was verified um, by the sub model. This is a sub 2000 model. This is a software that is provided um, by Berry University. And the final result for the permanent movement, the, residu the residual wall movement, was up to 262 millimeters, which means that the uh, bridge is not accessible. So, what men and the backfield soil are not considered in the uh, earthquake resistance system of the bridge? The general serviceability uh, related issues. Uh, such as the constraint movements of the apartment, the ratcheting effect that has been addressed in the past by Virginia uh, University, and the deck serviceability loading that was published several times by our team in, uh, back in my uh, previous university, in Aristotle University. And of course, the apartment soil is not reliable material. Who is going to design bridges relying on uh, the resistance of the backfill soil? So, uh, the initial thought when designing an earthquake resistant bridge that will all incorporate the abutment and the backfill soil in the lateral resisting system was to compromise between serviceability and earthquake resistance. Serviceability requires flexibility, and earthquake resistance requires high capacity. And methodology, of course, is um, the typical methodology for uh, uh, designing and analyzing bridges against earthquakes, known as dynamic type history analysis with acrograms reduced to Eurocodes 8 part 1 uh, response, response spectra, uh, detailed modeling of the dynamic system and comparisons uh, in terms of displacements, bedding moments, and shear actions of bridges to see if the new concept, the unconventional concept, is uh, efficient. And a lot of information about uh, nonlinear analysis of bridges in this uh, book, The Seismic Design and Assessment of Bridges, and you can also visit this web page uh, that is um, um, the page of work group 11 that is supposed to provide assessing knowledge on Eurocode uh, 8 part 2. And members of this group, the work group 11, uh, including myself, have strengthened the UK mirror group to follow developments and to propose changes um, to the brief part of uh, Europe code date. So, it was um, it's utilized only the conventional C-type abutment. Nothing was done differently from the typical design. 
uh, accept the, the, the expansion joints. The expansion joints in that case did not take into account uh, seismic movements. So the tech was interacting with this apartment and uh, basements between the typical case, which is the bridge with the large expansion joint and the bridge, conventional bridge with a small expansion joint was compared in terms of this, uh, deck displacements. What I found was that when an apartment participates in, 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 in the earthquake motion, then uh, the bending moment may reduce up to 25%, which means at the same time that we can design the piers uh, with smaller cross sections and uh, we can reduce uh, effectively the cost both the piers and the foundations. Can I just clarify one thing? Yes, of course. Are, are we, we are not fixing both of them, we are fixing one of them. Both of them. Both of them. It's not actually, um, it is not actually fixing. We, we do provide uh, an expansion joint between the deck and the, ba and the back wall, but the, 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 the magnitude of this expansion joint, the gap, is much smaller than the typical one, than the one that code requires. So there's an interaction between the deck and the element. And further to that, the backfill soil is activated because the pack wall moves towards the, the, the backfill soil. So that was the idea, to, uh, to involve uh, the, the abutment into the seismic problem. Uh, having recognized that um, displacements are reduced uh, and the bending moments of the piers are reduced due to this interaction, uh, the back wall was strengthened. Let, let's see what, what, what will happen if the back wall is um, a high capacity external shear key, high capacity external support, having a thickness equal to 1 up to 1.5 meters. Uh, so we did some analysis, I'm not going to go through analysis with MATLAB, uh, but the fact was that the displacements were further reduced, the displacements were reduced up to 40%. Then we shed more light on the, in the unexploited um, process of the backfill soil, and we extended the, the deck lab of, of the bridge towards the backfill soil. And what was done after that was to restrain this slab, this continuity slab, uh, into the backfill soil. So these tiles uh, combine flexibility with earthquake resistance. Why? because the piles have uh, quite small cross-sections, so they are quite flexible. And at the same time, uh, we can also utilize expanded polyester layers uh, just uh, below this uh, pile cap of the piles in order to increase flexibility of the piles to receive flexibility movements due to thermal effects. During earthquake, it is tied to the back soil and as such, the placements were found to be reduced up to 70%. This is a tremendously large uh, reduction in, in seismic movements, which means that the piers might be very slender, and, uh, and the, the level of safety of the, of the safety of the ridge remains essentially the same, since bridges, the conventional and the unconventional one, which utilize this uh, system, uh, were designed according to uh, Euro Date Part 2 in that case. Uh, then the idea um, was evolved into an external stopper. Uh, we said, okay, the backfill soil is not a reliable material, so we have to provide um, very specific properties of the backfill soil in order to utilize the backfill soil. So we said, okay, there are many bridges that uh, are adjacent to uh, tunnels, so let's tie this bridge to the adjacent tunnel. Uh, and this was uh, provided through a, an extended shear key uh, having a quite large volume, and you can see here the shear key that is uh, uh, actually, uh, restraining the movements of the deck, both the longitudinal and the transverse, the transverse movements of the deck uh, during earthquakes. You can see here the response time history uh, analysis of the deck, and of course, this shear key has to take into account thermal movements. Expansion joints were left um, between the shear key and the foundation of the, uh, of the tunnel in order to provide um, 
um, space for the movement of the text. The decisions were found to be reduced by 75%, and it is that this key can be utilized not only as uh, a tunnel is adjacent to the to the bridge, but uh, all, uh, a concrete structure may be uh, developed there, may be designed there, in order to restrain uh, seismic movement. So there are many different ways that, uh, which are very helpful to avoid uh, extensive use of bearings and large cross sections for the piers. It was another idea that was published in uh, uh, the Journal of American Society of Civil Engineers, the Journal of Bridge Engineering. Uh, we control the bounding forces. The deck actually collides on these capacity wing walls. The wing walls were strengthened in that case. And the wing walls transfer the seismic load to the foundation of the abutment. And you can see here that uh, uh, additional measures were provided to avoid sliding of this foundation. Displacements were reduced up to 35%. Uh, it is underlined that this bridge was a quite heavy bridge, uh, a heavy bridge, uh, and that the initial concept for the design of this was to apply heavy <coughs> com uh, combination of uh, high dumping rubber bearings and viscous dampers. So the conventional design without uh, dampers was compared and still the displacements were reduced uh, up to 35%. If we want to control uh, uh, the, the dissipation through um, elements, we can utilize uh, restraining walls. Of course, we have to optimize the design procedure, as uh, these walls are supposed to, are expected to receive serviceability movements, and they should be, should remain during the bridge service, while respond in, uh, in, uh, in, elastic, in an inelastic manner during earthquakes. In that case, displacements were reduced up to 67% uh, when the stiffness and high behavior of these restraining walls was taken into account. So uh, the concept can be applied also uh, uh, in case we want to retrofit, to strengthen a bridge against seismic loads. And in, in that case, uh, the measures are even more uh, effective due to the fact that we don't have to take into account creep and shrinkage effects. Creep and shrinkage effect, effects have already been developed during the first two or three years of the bridge service, and then we can close uh, the expansion joints uh, by very small expansion joints, and so the bridge may interact with an external system uh, restraining the, 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 the seismic movement effectively. Uh, so. At the time, uh, most of these bridges, uh, you know, uh, you know that m most of these bridges have simply supported uh, spans, which means that there are expansion joints uh, over each pier. So in that case, it was considered to be uh, essential to uh, connect the adjacent spans. And you can see here uh, what was done: a cast in situ co uh, concrete slab was utilized to connect the, the slab of the adjacent spans, and at the same time, a cable restrainer uh, was utilized to connect the adjacent uh, I-beams, the pre-stressed beams, uh, and this tendon, this cable restrainer, uh, was installed uh, on the level of uh, the center of gravity of the deck cross section in order to avoid secondary uh, bending moments. So uh, it wound, after analyzing this old, quite old bridge uh, built back, into, back in 1986, in fact, it was found that these mirrors were adequate to additional seismic loads. So the, the bridge uh, is, is going to be, uh, um, uh, w when the bridge was checked against the uh, Eurocodes 8 part 2 uh, design provisions, the, the bridge was found, was found to be um, uh, adapted to receive the seismic loads. If we want to disrupt traffic, we can apply different measures, such as such the ones I'm showing here, so what was done here was that instead of utilizing uh, pipes, we can use external barred walls, so the one shown here with a with a green color, and connect the adjacent spans by these uh, red lines you, that you can see here. Model uh, those are new sidewalks, in, in fact, and you can see here what was the uh, invasion uh, on the sidewalk. So part of the sidewalk was replaced. It's, um, a cast in situ part of the slab uh, appropriately reinforced was utilized, 
and the new elements, the horizontal one and the vertical one, was connected through dowels with the existing part of the slab. So, as you can see, the middle part of the bridge is accessible and uh, uh, the bridge was retrofitted without uh, disrupting, without closing off uh, the road. I'm a bit confused. <coughs> to, 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 to touch the 